Responses are higher than they should be. Thanks, Dave. Mm -hmm. The responses are higher than it should be. So the muscle spindles are sending a normal signal, but the response to it is to raise the tone higher than it should be. Um, that will also lead to neuromuscular incoordination. So that's going to lead to weakness. Okay, so your strength doesn't go up, your strength goes down because of the incoordination between the signals. This meeting is being recorded. That's a new one on me. I haven't heard that warning before. Um, so actually, I put me off his stride a bit there. Where were we? Yeah, so vasotone goes up as well. So um, this has a, an effect on one of the primary signs of segmental facilitation, and that's a lack of hyperemia when you scratch the skin. So um, everything goes up. You get trophodema, like pitting edema in the skin, actually. You, I had a good slide of this. It was a matchstick, sticking a matchstick in the sting, in the skin rather, and you could see the little pits it was forming. And that's because of vaso um, hypertonus. So um, yeah, everything's turned up. With reflex inhibition, yeah, everything's turned down. So tone goes down and they get a break in weakness. And I'm not sure that's necessarily because of inhibition. Well, it is. Um, yeah, we'll just say it's the inhibition to call that. It's easier for the moment. So um, these are the two main features of reflex inhibition is breaking weakness, you'll they'll generate a strong contraction and then it'll break, especially when you're doing an eccentric contraction from the end of range, pushing it into range, um, it will break. And also the lower tone. Now, the, these two effects are found around the joint that's causing it. So it's patterned, but it's patterned around the joint. It's usually in a PNF pattern, um, where it's segmental facilitation the effects of that is seen throughout the segment. It's more profound the closer to the segment you're looking than it is further distantly, but it is all the way through the segment. So I quite like that. Yeah, one's turned up and one's turned down. Okay, Ryan? Jim, when we're talking about reflex inhibition versus segmental facilitation, those themselves are not differential diagnoses. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. They exactly. are exactly. components that we could see in conjunction with one of our di differential diagnoses. Well, let me make it easier well, for you. Easier. I've got an echo on this. Um, they're signs and symptoms. They're signs and symptoms, basically signs more than symptoms, but they're signs. Um, now they're not signs of a specific condition. They're signs of a neurophysiological state. So reflex inhibition is caused by inadequate proprioception. And whatever's causing that can result in reflex inhibition via the inadequate proprioception. So these are not specific to any condition other than the neurophysiological state that that condition is causing. Is that okay? Yes, got it, thank so you. That's why they're not important to the diagnosis. Yep. Um, and the same with reflex inhibition. That, in my opinion, is caused by nociception. Um, and if the condition that the patient's complaining of is nociceptive, then it can cause segmental facilitation. It's kind of like, kind of like we were talking about the multiple eye muscles. In you know, the classic studies where they do with pigs, where they inject saline into the disc. Yeah. And you see inhibition of the multifidi due to the pain that's occurring there. Yeah. I think it's similar with the facet joint as well, it's it irritating the facet joint. And They're all the same. Inhibition. Yeah, it's all the same, really. Um, if you're looking at multivitous inhibition, it has to be local. The muscle crossing, the muscle that's inhibited must be crossing the joint. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're talking about multivitous, mm -hmm. that could be the disc, it's a, it is a joint, and it could be the facet joint. Um, but they've got to be producing inadequate proprioception. That's not necessarily hypomobility. That could be hypermobility because you've got an increased range, but not with increased proprioception. So the proprioception, relatively speaking, is decreased. Could be instability. Um, mm -hmm. So almost any biomechanical condition is going to cause reduced reflex inhibition. 
I assume there's a few neurological ones that may produce increased proprioception, maybe Parkinson's, but I can't think of any biomechanical ones that would do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's this, these are universal things. It doesn't matter where you're looking, you're going to find it. Um, either, either nothing at all, um, or it's going to be segmental facilitation, or it's going to be reflex inhibition. So Jim, let's talk about it. then, okay, the sprained ankle model. And now all of a sudden you have weakness around the ankle, you know, yeah. and it's th two months later. You know, how, how does that relate to reflex inhibition versus pain inhibition versus segmental facilitation? Well, it's interesting. The, the, the Australians came up, I, I seem to remember talking about this before, did I? Yeah, but they might understand it this time. <laughs> I th why, okay. Did we show that video twice then? I don't know. I don't think so. All right. So this is the Australian model of it. Um, or it's the model that they brought out in the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't agree with this model entirely, but what they'll say is there's been an injury and the injury has been bad enough to produce pain inhibition, sprained ankle. So you now have pain inhibition caused by the pain. If that goes on for any length of time, um, that will convert to reflex inhibition because you're not moving the joint structures through their range. So over time, that will convert to reflex inhibition. So even when the pain goes away, you're still left with that reflex inhibition. Now, the reflex inhibition will decrease the tone of the muscle stabilizing the joint, the local stabilizers now. In the spine's case, it will be multivitous. In the ankle, it's gonna be the big muscles. Um, but those ones, you'll get an increase in neutral zone of the joints. If you're not sure, the neutral zone is the area of movement that is not barriered at all. There's no dynamic control to that bit of movement. So the muscle tone doesn't limit movement in that. The joint structures don't limit it. So there's a free movement in it. Not very big usually. There's a little bit of play in there that isn't limited by any structure. That's the neutral zone. If you lose... Um, the stabilizers, particularly in a single direction, which you would get with pain inhibition. But if you lose these stabilizers in a particular direction, then you're going to start seeing increases in that neutral zone into that direction because you've lost the tone. That will lead to more proprioceptive loss, which will lead to more reflex inhibition, which will lead to more proprioceptive loss, and so on and so on. So you get this negative feedback loop kicking in. Um, so over time, that neutral zone will increase to the point where it starts to incur on the end zone of the joint, which is limited by inert structures. When they start taking a beating, you'll start seeing end zone instabilities, which I assume can become, well, I know they can, they don't always, but they can become painful. Um, so that this is a breakdown of the of this stabilizes from the inside out. This is all neuro neurophysiological. You break down, um, you lose the stabilizers through pain inhibition, that converts to reflex inhibition. The neutral zone increases and increases. The reflex inhibition gets worse and worse, the more neutral zone increase until the end zone structures start to take a hip and then it becomes clinical. The other way of looking at this, which I think is much more common than that, is that you start stressing the joint out because of local um, hypomobility. And so uh, if you like, we take, let's take two spinal segments. L5S1 is jammed up and it can't move. So L4-5 starts moving more to compensate for that loss. And it will be moving in a particular direction, the one that L5 can't do. So let's say it can't extend. L4 will start extending more and that will break down the end zone structures. When the end zone structures break down, um, you start getting proprioceptive loss because the proprioceptors in the end zone structures are not firing. So now you get reflex inhibition loss and the neutral zone increases. So one breaks down from the inside out, the other breaks down from the inside in. Now, if it's breaking down from the outside in, you can do something about it. 
you can take the stress off the joint by finding whatever's putting the stress on the joint. If it's breaking down from the inside out, that's history. You can't do anything about the past. All you can now try and do is stabilize the joint. Whereas if you've got a hypomobility that's causing this problem or a structural problem, long leg or whatever, but if you've got a, an external cause, external to the joint that's breaking down, you may be able to deal with that. And now your rehab is going to be successful. If you don't deal with the hypomobility that's causing the whole thing, your rehab is going to be unsuccessful. So it's important that you differentiate the two. Okay, Kristen, did you think of anything else? Oh, you've been busy listening, I suppose, have you? <laughs> <laughs> listening oh. a lot. <laughs> um, I guess when we were going over in the videos, it was, you were talking about kind of going into testing them then. Um, and so for segmental facilitation, you were kind of talking about how everything like um, proximal to that area will be affected versus in reflex inhibition, it's just at the, like any like muscles crossing a joint, correct? Yeah. Like if you go to, when you go to do muscle testing? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, <laughs> go on, sorry. No, no, you're good. Um, segmental facilitation is generally found out when you start mus manual muscle testing. If, if you're just doing this as part of the diagnostic exam, not an etiological search, and you start looking at the strength of things, you'll find there's weakness. And if it's significant, if the segmental facilitation is significant, you'll find weakness in a segmental pattern, which will initially believe, lead you to believe in that this is a radiculopathy. The difference between the two, there's a couple of differences. One is that a radiculopathy will produce fatigable weakness, almost always. So as you're, if you do repeat testing, they will those repeat contractile tests, isometric tests, will rapidly weaken one after the other after the other until you have almost no contraction left. With segmental facilitation, that doesn't happen. Not in that sort of short period. So it's non-fatigable. The big thing though, is that if the weakness is caused by segmental facilitation and you wobble a tissue in that segment, that is you input proprioception, say, it, I don't, don't really care, L5, and you've got L5 segmental facilitation. So if you do PAs on L5, you then immediately go back, check the strength of the L5 myotone. And if that now has in significantly increased or is normal, that's a segmental facilitation because you can't change weakness in a radiculopathy by wobbling a vertebra. Is that okay? So is that how is that how you would differentiate? Like, say you're between a radiculopathy and a segmental facilitation. Yeah. Would you do your muscle yeah. testing and then try a wobble and then go back yeah. and retest? Yeah. Okay. But look where I was. You found the segmental facilitation not because you suspected it was there, but because you found segmental weakness. And that's why we spend so much time like doing the manual muscle testing and the initial exam, because it's not so much about, you know, just ruling in and out pain. You know, you're going to use it for tendinopathies or tendinosis, but it's looking for these subtle things so that it's almost like getting information about your etiology, sometimes even maybe before you have the diagnosis, but it's yeah. something you're, you're putting in the back of your mind that, okay, I have, I have something going on here at the, at the, say the biceps and wrist extensors. So you're thinking, okay, do I have something going on at C6? That I need to kind of go back and, and sort out. The best thing you can do is think scientifically here. If you find segmental weakness, you generate a hypothesis. Your first hypothesis might be that it's a radiculopathy. Probably wouldn't be mine, but that might be your first one. So you test that hypothesis with looking at the weakness and seeing if you can wobble it. Now, all the rest of this is okay, but it's not related to the weakness. You can test for sensation. But you see what you're doing. As soon as you start testing reflexes and sensation testing, you are now into positive differential diagnosis, all of which takes time and is less reliable than looking to eliminate the differential diagnosis. So you can eliminate the differential diagnosis of radiculopathy very quickly by wobbling. If the strength increases, it's not a radiculopathy or a neuropathy. So then you move on to H2, 
which is segmental facilitation, you find that you've got non-breaking weakness that does adapt to uh, wobbling. And now you can look, maybe not on that treatment setting because you've wobbled it, but now you can look for the other sides of segmental facilitation, such as hypertonicity, increased reflex responses, and so on. But if you do this, not haphazardly, but do it like a scientific, use the scientific method, generate a hypothesis, test the hypothesis. But also remember that in this instance, your first job is to make the diagnosis. So anything extra you find, Dave's right, put it in your pocket and take it out later on, look at it, okay? Yeah, I would typically at that point, probably go to the neck pretty quickly and wobble it and see if it, I reduce it. And then if the strength comes back in both of those and now I have non-breaking or non-fatiguing weakness, then I feel pretty confident that what I saw was a facilitation. Yeah, but you understand the problem with this is mm -hmm. if you want to investigate that facilitation more, because mm -hmm. now you're looking to prove it rather than like really prove it. Sudden, you've proved that it's not a radiculopathy. You haven't proven that it's reflex inhibition. If you want to prove the reflex inhibition now, what you're going to have to do is look at all the other signs of reflex inhibition, such as tone, tone increases, mm -hmm. reflex changes, and so on. The problem is you've wobbled it. And those signs yeah. are not likely to be there. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to wait until the next time they come in. So it's all swings and roundabouts. You've got to figure out a priority of how you're doing, what you're doing. Okay. Yeah, I guess, in, I guess an upper extremity example, the one that you covered with tennis elbow. Yeah. You know, this patient could be one that's coming in with lateral, epi, you know, epicondylasia, let's call it, just because it's not an itis, it's called more of an osis. And then when you start to do your, your muscle testing and reflex testing, you start to pick up that, hey, there's something segmental going on here that may be an etiology or contributor to my primary diagnosis of extensor tendinopathy. You know, I'm not thinking, oh, this is a primary facilitation as my diagnosis. It's something that I'm coming across as yeah. this could be a potential contributor to it. And that's kind of a classic one in the upper extremity. I see it in shoulder pain, you yeah. know, cause you get a C5 or C6, C7 problem. And now all of a sudden, you know, their, their, their biomechanics are off and they're, they're beating up their shoulder. Yeah, these are major, if they're not major causes, they're major contributors. Um, yeah. But understand this. I would strongly, very strongly suggest mm -hmm. that you make the diagnosis and then you look for the etiology. Because the etiology, once you've made the diagnosis, you can tell whether what you're finding is relevant or not. For example, if you find segmental facilitation of T1, you're not going to link that up directly with the tennis elbow. Okay, so make the diagnosis, then look at the etiology. Don't try and do everything at once. Experts do this and they get away with it. I can guarantee you one. Okay, until you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. I guess another yeah, example of this hmm? maybe like looking at, okay, let's look at Again, back to the lateral ankle sprain. Now, all of a sudden, we have ankle weakness in this individual. And you're months out, you know, so that differential in ankle weakness is, you know, how defined it would be that, okay, if I have multidirectional, you know, non-fatiguing weakness, am I more looking at something that's a reflex inhibition around the ankle, which is going to have impacts up through the kinetic chain as well. And you're going to see changes into the hip and elsewhere leading to problems. But if I find that weakness in that, th in that thing, is it a lack of proprioception coming in because, okay, I've torn the ligaments and the way the joint is moving? You know, I have an expanded neutral zone from the ankle. You know, the other one would be if this looks segmental, like it's an L L5 or S1 facilitation could be doing this. So by having the, the, the exam afterward thinking, okay, I know I have a lateral ankle sprain or maybe a tendinopathy in the ankle. Now I'm getting into what are the etiologies now that we're several months out from the ankle sprain. And these will be things that will drive it. And we all know that, okay, six months after an ankle sprain, there's an increased risk for lower extremity injuries based on the proprioceptive changes that have occurred at the ankle. So that can get into a bigger category. Is it all just local reflex inhibition? Because there is some talk, there is research on cortical remapping that occurs once you've had this long enough. Basically, your brain map changes and how you recruit these patterns. And you become, you get a gimpy pattern that can be cortically driven as well. Yeah, you're in the neuro rehab there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and this is why nobody wants to do neuro. It's too bloody difficult. Um, 
Yeah, just, this gets complicated, all right? This does get complicated, which is why this is an introduction. Um, you, you're going to have to sort out the difference between whether the segmental facilitation is a cause or an effect of an injury. Same with the reflex inhibition. You're going to have to differentiate uncertain segmental facilitation from uncertain reflex inhibition as well. This gets complicated, but don't worry about that right now, okay? Just get familiar with the terms, understand the concepts of this, and don't get overly concerned, mm -hmm. all right? John, have you got anything? Yeah, uh, for segmental, for either, I guess, you've kind of been talking about it in a unilateral sense, is, in a unilateral sense. Is it ever bilateral or is that not really a hallmark of either of those? Um, I think if it was bilateral, I'd be thinking of something a bit more serious. Uh, I'd never say nothing's impossible, but it's certainly unusual. Um, you'd have to have a central lesion that is producing exactly the same problem. Now, if you get something like uh, a disc on it, well, let's say, uh, okay, let's say that you've, how would you have to do this? It would almost have to get a symmetrical reflex inhibition of multifidus in the neck, for example, or in the lumbar spine. The only way I can think you could do this and not have major, major neurological problems is a vertical herniation of the disc into the end plate. <laughs> Anything else, a central, a, a, a median herniation of the disc is going to give you much bigger problems than reflex inhibition. It's going to give you a cordial quiet problem or a spinal cord problem. Um, I can't think of anything that's minor that will do that. I can't. Dave, can you? I'm working on it. No, I mean, you know, I mean, you, you'd have it almost have to be like a, a bilateral, maybe some stenotic or inflammation or some type of sensitization of that nerve, but it had to be occurring bilaterally, which I, I don't ever really see. I can't, I'm can't I'm trying to think, and I can't really recall having ever seen it bilateral. Yeah. And as I say, that would be a lot more serious. You've got bigger, bigger problems than reflexion yeah. with that. Like you're looking at bilateral neuritis is, uh, yeah. Medium disc herniation, central stenosis is actually compressing the cord. There's all sorts of things that could be going on, but you've got bigger problems than reflex inhibition. It won't be a diagnostic issue for you. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, as well, reflex inhibition isn't a diagnosis anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ariel, have you got anything? Not right now. Okie dokie. Michelle. Not that I can think of, Jim. All right. Patrick? No, not at this moment. It's Stephanie. Just one question on the wobble specifics. Um, are you yeah. just trying it one time for like 15, 30 seconds? I know Dave did it um, to one of the um, people over the weekend course. Um, are you just trying it one time? And if you see a change, um, OK. But if you don't see a change, you're not trying it again? Well, you, yes. Um, what are we talking about? Segmental facilitation or reflex inhibition? Or don't you care? You don't care, do you? No, uh, it'd be more so if you notice a difference. Yeah, um, okay. So trying to determine the difference between the two of them. If segmental facilitation doesn't improve with wobble, you have to question segmental facilitation being present. Mm -hmm. Reflex inhibition is a different animal. Um, Let's go back to the multivitus again, shall we? If you palpate multivitus, you're actually looking for changes in the bulk. Either the bulk of the muscle is increased or it's decreased or it's normal. So if the bulk has increased, that's going to be hypertonicity. It won't be hypertrophy, not of a single segment like that. So it's going to be hypertonicity. But if the bulk's decreased, that could be hypotonicity or atrophy. Now, if it's atrophied, you wobbling the segment may well not make a lot of difference to that muscle because of the atrophy. If this is major atrophy, 50% of the muscle or so, you may not see a change coming on. Now, what you can do at that point, and what I would do is stim it. I'd use electrical stim, probably putting a needle into it and then stimming it electrically, but stim it electrically, giving it 15 minutes of electrical stimulation and then recheck it. 
Now, if it hasn't come back, I'd be happy to say that was atrophied. But if it's recoverable, it should recover in about well, 10 or 15 seconds at most, I would think. I've yeah. never seen it not do that and then re and then respond to STEM. Yeah. Paul Hodges did a great summary of the this multivalent concept. It's, it's in the fellowship reading, it's changes. I just posted on the meeting chat, changes in structure and function of lower back muscles. Or there's nice curves demonstrating this, this inhibition atrophy to fibrotic curve and kind of where it goes in there. And he'll go into some of the rehab principles, but he'll also get into, he doesn't use the term reflex inhibition, but you'll see it, how he models that concept. Though so he doesn't use that term specifically. When you read the article, it's like, okay, that's he, this is what we mean by reflex inhibition. This is what he's talking about. And then it'll also allude a little bit to just the cortical mapping changes that will occur with these types of injuries where the brain map tends to change a bit. He's got books with the term. He used the term in the book he did with Gwen Joel and Hodges and the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I've not seen any studies done on peripheral muscles and reflex inhibition. Do you know any? One thing it would be was that stuff I've seen now has been coming from the Australians, and it's that idea of they're using transcranial stem to look at the brain as they do these things. I saw a nice one with. I think they did it with a lumbar multifidi, and they also did it with Achilles tendinopathy, where they looked at these people weren't getting better, you know, after they've done the, the eccentric loading and loading programs, was that the cortical map was different in normals to those with Achilles tendinopathy that was chronic. So they found that they needed to kind of get a feed forward mechanism to make them more actively recruit the system to change that cortical map. Yeah, it's a bit of a no brainer there. But do you know of any ones with. Um... Will they demonstrate atrophy in peripheral muscles? I do not off the top of my head, no. No, I don't know, neither. I'll have a word with chat GPT, see if she... No, she won't, because she probably won't. Um, okay. So who was that who asked? Uh, Stephanie, is that okay for you? Yes, that makes sense. Thank you. Uh, Abby, have you got anything? I don't think so. Okay, yeah. Teresa? Nope, I'm good. You're lit up, so you must be muted. Sorry, Jim, I said that I'm good. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Kevin. <laughs> yeah, Jim, I'm a little unclear. Can you go back? and talk more about this inside out versus outside in you said if it's inside out we don't have a chance of doing much about it so yeah. when the outside in are you referring to more an example in terms of the ankle maybe just acute trauma where we can no, go in and treat no, the tissue no there's nothing you can do about acute trauma they're already at it so if if this is a trauma causing pain inhibition leading to reflex inhibition leading to end zone inhibition the cause of it was a trauma that's years in the past you can't change that so what you're left with now is you can't remove that stress so what you're left with now is rehabbing it as best you can if on the other hand it's an ongoing problem let's say the hip can't extend and it's stressing out l5s1 and l5s1 becomes unstable because of the stress being placed for it by the hip not extended so we have an extension hypermobility, extension hypermobility into an instability, into a subluxation. So you, the patient comes with low back pain, you diagnose it as an L5S1 extension subluxation. You're gonna manipulate the lumbar spine, you may re-educate it, and that ain't gonna change it, not over the long term, because that stress is still there. If the stress broke down a healthy structure, your attempts at rehabilitation ain't gonna be as good as the original equipment. So what you've got to do is get the stress off of that segment. And you do that, in this case, by dealing with the hip and getting that mobile again. And then you've got to stabilize the hip. So you can do something about proximate causes of the stress on the unstable joint or segment. You can't do anything about the historical causes of it. Is that okay? Yeah, that clears it up. Thank you. Okay. Jacob. 
Yes. Have you got a question or a comment? Um, honestly, not really to this point. No, everything's making sense. I'm glad we're diving into more detail from what we talked about this weekend. I think especially with uh, understanding, like we we did a lot of manual practice this weekend. So understanding yeah. the like why we're doing what we're doing has been helping a lot because I feel like I, I learned the skills, but I was like, okay, how do I apply this? All right, good. That's what these sessions are about as much as anything else. They're tutorials. Well, they should be. Mm -hmm. Cervantes, I'm never going to get you for this name. It's always going to be wrong. No, that's okay. I, I've been called Cervantes before. Uh, I, I did want to ask as far as the inside, inside out versus outside in. So I know we talked about like hip euphor over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And I would that be a breakdown from the outside in? In that case, um, if the hip is... Not necessarily. I mean, you can break the hip down in a lot of different ways. Um, so let's have a, see the hip is one of these joints that undergo sort of primary degeneration, isn't it? There are so many artificial hips and knees wandering about, you have to wonder whether these degenerate easily. And in the hips case, it's really a delicate balance. You've got the Q angle of the neck, whether it's antiverted, retroverted, whether the Q angle of the neck is too much, too little. You've got the Q angle of the femur that's going to stress the hip as well. So the knee plays a role in that. So if this is a structural thing, um, which it may well be, that could be either, actually. It could be inside out or outside in. But you certainly can't change that etiology. Not if it's genetic, not if it's congenital, all right? So this is really what it comes down to. Is this a thing, is it a stress that I can remove? That's the real question here. Can I remove the stress that's causing this instability? If the answer to that is no, then you've got nothing to do except try to stabilize it. And it's, as there's no ongoing stress, presumably, then it should get better with, or as better as it gets with rehab. If you leave the stressor in place, then your rehab attempts won't make any long-term difference because the stressor is still there. So um, the, trauma's easy. You ask them, in the, like, have you had a major injury to this joint? Now, what the Australians said, and I don't know if they're still saying this, when there was a question about this, um, why is it trauma is not a consistent factor in all of these segmental instabilities? Their answer was because patients don't remember the trauma. This trauma is enough to produce pain inhibition. You will remember that. And it has to go on long enough to um, produce reflex inhibition afterwards. Now, this is an awful lot of bad memories. So I don't believe that for a minute. There's two avenues to this. There's two, two pathways to destabilizing a joint or a segment. Can you remove the stressor? That's the only question you really have to ask yourself. Can you find a stressor that could be responsible for this instability? And even if they say, yeah, I had a major trauma when I was a kid and I had lots of pain, it went on for a long time. That may not be the only answer. It may well be that's what kicked off the problem, but there may be contributing factors um, such as leg length discrepancies and so on, um, hypomobilities here and there that are contributing to it, and those you can remove. So it's not always as clear cut as I'm making it. Yeah, and that's also why we started a bit with like you know even that postural exam to go into to see what it, what you know posture isn't everything. It doesn't cause all the problems, but you have to understand where their baseline starting point is to say you know what's the low hanging fruit? Are they constantly standing with this hip anteriorly translated? You know, is it that when they walk, they're over, they're overstriding for whatever reason and driving the hip anteriorly, and this is creating the stressor. So that's that outside in versus inside out model. I think that Jim's talking about. So when looking at that anterior hip model, you want to, you want to think about it in those terms of you know what is in their habitual patterns that may be contributing to it. Is it they're always standing with a femur anteriorly translated and medially rotated? which is the common posture they'll talk about that it being in, in this model where it'll be, it's not always subluxed when the hip is living there. It's just spending a lot of time living there and then it becomes subluxed once, it be, once you get micro instability in the hip. And radiologists will talk about this and that's what they, the term they use is the micro instability of the hip is the radiological term they talk about when you get this breakdown of the anterior capsule and the labrum. 
The micro micro instability is thing of the cartilage. Don't forget, degeneration is always about hypermobility and inst certainly instability in the first instance, always. Whether the joint actually becomes fibrotic or arthrotic and then becomes hypermobile is up for grabs, but it's always initially instability. Okay. Chris, got anything? So I had a question with the wobble. Um, say it's segmental facilitation, say it's like L5 and you're going to wobble. Is that just yeah. like a tapping on it? Or is it no, like do a PA? Do PAs. Do PAs. Do PAs. Just make sure that they're not producing pain. Okay. It's more than a tap. You won't get away with the tap. But, it's, but put, do PAs. Or if you're doing um, a peripheral joint, you can do glides, you can do physiological movements to it. Okay, but it's more than tapping it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Chan? I'm good, Jim. Thank you. Okay. All right, I've gone through everybody. Does any about anybody got anything else on this? I have, sorry, I have one last question. Don't apologize for it. Okay, sorry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You got me. Um, really quick, just to bring up the wobble one last time in terms of, um, say you wobble and you retest like um, the manual muscle test, it's stronger. You can automatically assume there's a segmental facilitation, correct? No, no. you can assume that it's not a ridiculopathy. Okay. Okay, I think that's the question I had in terms of trying to categorize them versus yeah. then like wobbling mm -hmm. for reflex inhibition. And are you just seeing like a hypotonicity or an atrophy? Only if you're lucky. Look, we, we list this, this stuff out like it's always present. It's, it's consistently there and it's obvious. It's not. We talk mm -hmm. about segmental facilitation being non-fatigable weakness and breaking weak and reflex, in, and reflex inhibition being breaking weakness. There's gray areas in there. So it's going to be more than one test quite often that you're going to have to do. Um, we talk about it being segmentally distributed versus locally. That's not necessarily true. Well, it is true, but your testing may not be sensitive enough to pick up the segmentalness of it when you're right down the other end. It can also be a combination of both. You can have segmental facilitation through the segment and reflex inhibition around the joint that's causing the segmental facilitation. So it isn't as clear cut as it seems at the moment. Um, so all you can assume if your strength gets better is that this is not neurological weakness. And then you have to make a hypothesis, segmental facilitation, and then prove it, or it collapses under the attempt at proving it, or, and then go to H2, which may be reflex inhibition, and then prove that. But these are positive proofs now not negative that makes sense thank you okay good anybody else okay that was instructive what i'd like to do is talk to you about the relationship between the essential illness script i know we've done this and i'm going to do it again anyway this is going to be a recurring theme essential illness script hypothesis h1 and differential diagnosis, um, all in the generation of a diagnosis, basically. So the two real things you've got to get hold of here is, well, two things. The first one is differential diagnosis. You've got to be quick at making these. And we've talked about it before, but if you picture the anatomical structures under the pain area, Apply a pathology to them, and they're your differential diagnosis. So if we take the knee, for example, under the skin, the forgetting fat and all the rest of this, the initial tissue is going to be the capsule and the medial collateral ligament. There's your first differential. Um, it's a, either a degenerative tear, a traumatic tear, or an attenuation, a strain. Is that okay? We, or that strain, I'm not going to use the word sprain here at all, strain. 
If you then go down the next layer, it's going to be the meniscus, the joint line, the joint itself. So we've got uh, the meniscus. Um, and then, so there's a differential diagnosis here, either a traumatic disc, uh, meniscus injury or a degenerative one. Then you go the next lower level down. And now we're really looking at the joint. So that's my next one down. It's an arthropathy. The sixth one is uh, it's referred. So if all of those tests are negative, with one exception, which I'll talk about in a second, but if all those tests are negative, then you look at referral as your H1. All right? That's how you make differential diagnosis, either to, to eliminate them or to use them as a diagnostic method. Is that straightforward? Look at the anatomy under the pain. That's your differential diagnosis. So now the essential illness script is pretty much what it says. It's the essence of the diagnostic requirements to make a particular condition fit. So if, again, let's look at medial collateral ligament. What do I need to diagnose that? What do I actually need to diagnose that? I don't care about the cause. It doesn't matter to me whether it's traumatic, whether it's um, pathological, I don't care. If I'm just saying that the medial collateral ligament is injured. So that doesn't come up in the history. The location of the pain does. Is there anything else in the history that we need to make this diagnosis of medial collateral ligament tear? Do you need anything else in the history? Can anybody think of anything? If there was a mechanism of injury? What if there's no injury? So the mechanism of injury doesn't tell you anything. It tells you whether there was trauma, um, but it doesn't tell you anything about the medial collateral ligament. So the mechanism of injury doesn't do this, does it? If there's no injury, it can still be a medial collateral ligament problem because of degeneration. Yeah? Anything else in history? Are you okay with that, Chris? And I'm not trying to browbeat you here. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Thanks. Okay. Anything else in the history you need? I'd probably want to know their description of their pain, Jim. You know, if they're describing it as lancinating or burning or if they're okay. hearing any popping. All right. Thing. All right. Now, that's fair enough from an examination perspective. Um, we've made this fairly specific to the ligament, all right? So um, you're absolutely right. That'll make a difference. If this is neuropathic pain, then I'm not thinking about anything with the knee at all. I'm thinking this is neurological, but you're absolutely right. But let's look at the medial clavicle. What we're looking at is the minimum requirements to make a diagnosis of a medial collateral ligament problem. Is that okay? Yeah, I got you. Anything else you need in the history? Okay. What objective tests do you need? A good one could be just palpating over the ligament and see if that reproduces their pain. Yeah, that's a perfect one to start with because it's just about 100% sensitive. Yeah. So palpation, if the palpation is negative, you move off that differential. Providing the palpation is accurate. Now, this is where errors come in. The mistake, the the um, the bias might be availability bias that this is a medial collateral ligament problem, but the error would be in your palpation. So if you palpate too deeply, for example, you're going to hit the joint line. The ligament might be all right taking that stress if it's not damaged, but when you hit the joint line, if this is a meniscus problem or an arthropathy, that's when you're going to get your positive. So you're making an error with your, your objective test that will feed into an error in the diagnosis. Yep. So, but 
accurate layer palpation will be positive. And if you're really good at it, it's going to be pretty specific as well. So yeah, palpation's number one test. Another test. You can stress the ligament. Yeah, we can valve stress it. Um, and to, to make sure you want to valve stress it in all of its positions, in flexion, off of extension, and in extension to make sure. Um, so if that's negative, then again, you probably want to check, recheck your palpation, make sure you know what you're doing properly and you've done what you should do, because it's unlikely. It's a Again, it's a pretty specific test and it's not going to be wrong very often. So if you're not picking up instability and you're not picking up pain from the test, it's unlikely to be the MCL. In fact, that's what you've been taught, isn't it? If the stress tests are negative, it's not a ligamentous problem, not the ligament you've tested anyway. So yeah. Now, okay, so we've got positive palpation. We've got a positive stress test. Anything else you need for the diagnosis? Just thinking, Jim, I, I would want to rule out a medial meniscus problem knowing that 50% of the MCL fibers attach there. I wouldn't do that yet. That's going to be your bias and error correction. But we're looking... Actually, you're not wrong. Sorry, I'll, I'll restate what I'm saying. What you have now if with the palpation and the um, MCL is you've got a provisional diagnosis, all right? It's provisional on there being no bias and no error. You're right there, Kevin. So I'm going to just restate. I was wrong. I'm going to restate the question. Is there anything else you need to make the provisional diagnosis? No. No. I don't think so either. And you're absolutely right, because now you attack it with bias and error correction. And, um, and, but also, not for the diagnosis now. Your diagnosis is going to remain the, the uh, medial collateral ligament. But you want to know if there's any other pathologies present. All right. So the diagnosis of a meniscus tear is going to be a different hypothesis entirely. But you fulfilled the requirements of H1, which was to, which was an MCL tear in this case. You've made the diagnosis. At that point, you can start planning to treat that tissue, and you should be looking at an expected prognosis. Yeah. Now it comes into play. We've not made any errors. We've not made there's been no bias in this. Are there any other pathologies that need to be dealt with? So you're looking at secondary pathologies now because these are not causing the patient's pain. So let's have a look at this from H1 again now. It's H1 is now becomes a meniscus tear. All right. So we're going to examine it. Looking at popping and cracking and all the other things and locking of the knee doesn't work terribly well. It works better on traumatic meniscus tears. It's not that great with degenerative tears. Um, so the likelihood is if this is degenerative, you're going to get negative answers and all that. So this wouldn't be a primary question because it wouldn't matter to me. The reason it's not primary for me is it doesn't matter whether the answer is yes or no. Okay, so what now? Really nothing in the history, because we're saying that the, the, t the pain is coming from the medial collateral ligament. It's unlikely to be the same pain you get with stressing is going to be from the meniscus, because that valgus stress test doesn't bother the meniscus very much at all. But there is another tissue there that might be affected by this, that could be affected by that could be contributing to the MCL pain rather than the meniscus. Any thoughts? I didn't mention it on the anatomy review going down. So again, go back up to the skin and work your way down. We've got the skin, subcutaneous fat, capsule, ligament, then I said meniscus. There's another tissue on the same level. Uh, gracilis or medial hamstring could also no, be- they're, they're all bad, they're all in the wrong area. Okay. 
Honestly. Yeah. This is pure anatomy now. Yeah. What attaches the meniscus to the tibia? Is it just the articular surface of the joint? No, it's a meniscotibial ligament or the coronary ligament. They're ligaments. They're attached by ligaments. Hmm. Yep. So you can tear this ligament as well. And that can be painful. And it'll give you a very similar pain to the MCL. But not to get too far into this, do you understand, though, that your first hypothesis is a patient's complaint? That's your primary diagnosis. After that, everything is secondary, which includes etiological diagnoses. Yeah? Let's try another... Oh, no, we've only got three minutes left. Um... I'm going to send Dave an exercise for you. It's a really simple one. I'm going to give you a bunch of, I think we did this last time. I'm going to give you a bunch of pains and you come up with three differential diagnoses for each one and eliminate them. Okay. So they form a hypothesis and then produce, then hypothesize one of those differentials and prove it. Okay. So a positive proof. Is that okay, guys? It's a good exercise. It's one you should be doing for yourselves. I read, I, I was, I'm doing a bit of research on the difference between competence, proficiency, mastery, and, and expertise. And as you go through this, the only way you progress through this, one of the elements of it is deliberate practice. You have to deliberately practice what you're trying to become an expert in. If it's a musical instrument, then you deliberately practice that. You do scales, you do something that's deliberate. If you're doing this game, then you deliberately practice areas. Don't, no, I'm not talking about treating patients, but not that type of practice. You deliberately practice conceptual areas and techniques. And that way you'll get better at them. And you've got to maintain self a self-critical approach to this. You've got to be prepared to say, I'm wrong, and I'm not doing this as well as I can do. But deliberate practice is the way to go, no doubt about it. It's one of the elements. Okay? All right, guys. Eyes are done. All right, guys. Eyes are done.